Thanks for taking your seats. We were waiting just a few minutes because we have a couple of student groups who I think are having a hard time extricating themselves from the outdoor exhibition. I hope you've all seen it. It's so incredibly beautiful. Um, I'm Carrie Barrett, by the way, the president of the New York Botanical Garden. And one of my favorite things all summer in the Burley Marx exhibition, so incredible in so many ways, was when visitors come and say, will this be here permanently? And what I love about that is that it has the effect of transporting you so closely to the tropics, whether that in your mind you're in Rio or Sao Paulo or some people think they're in Miami, that they've forgotten that in about a month it will be 50 degrees and, and possibly snow. So what happens, what happens after the show? Bring all your friends, talk it up. The show is open for two more glorious weeks. We're delighted that the last week of the show coincides with Climate Week in New York City. And it, we have no better time for us to be celebrating the great Roberto Barley Marx um, than during Climate Week at a time we've been saying, I wrote a letter to the trustees, just last week saying we can't, he would be horrified by what's going on in the Amazon rainforest right now. The fires and the, and the destructions. We're taking, seizing the opportunity and sending a team of botanists who normally work in the Amazon, but um, they, they've shifted their travel schedule to go down now to see, not to, not to stop the fires, but to do more of what they do, which is to collect plants, to teach the stewardship, forest stewardry, um, so that locals um, in the University of Rondonia is the particular place where we're going, um, teaching, teaching um, native Brazilians you know, how to preserve trees and that it's important to preserve them. So all of this wrapped up into a day where we'll be talking about some of the same things, I think. We have, um, this, Roberto Burley Marx, as you all know, I hope the show's been here since early summer, and some of you may have attended our first symposium, which was about his art, his design, and his work as a, as a, um, as a landscape architect and an environmentalist. He um, was just an extraordinary Renaissance man. From Raymond Jungles, who was a student of Burley Marx and designed our outdoor exhibition. We learned so much about him personally, his love of life, a gregarious man who went on expeditions, not only with students, but with friends, who developed a, um, a practice in landscape design exclusively using native plants, very, very important, and for that purpose, collected them. I had the pleasure last year in, um, in, last year in April of going to the CTO to see the CTO and also to see some of his um, private landscapes which are still maintained and we were, we were in Rio but um, the CTO is just a, a phenomenal place and you can just you can feel his presence you sort of miss um, someone said he sang all the time and, bef and on afternoons before he would serve a wonderful, wonderful um, Brazilian dinner with, with wine and drinks, you'd all draw on tablecloths together. A very, again, a very gregarious, loving man who loved music, loved art, and kind of an enveloping presence that got everybody all fired up about what he cared most about, which, which was the activism in the environment. Um, Edward Sullivan, who was our guest curator for this exhibition, is with us today, unless he's still out there with his, with his students somewhere, but we're deeply, um, deeply grateful to Edward, um, a distinguished professor from NYU, who helped us rediscover Burley Marx's modernist impact. I, I realized, I mean, I knew I'm uh, the head of the garden, but I'm an art historian by training, and even I had heard very, very little about Burley Marx, and when we were planning this exhibition, one of our great worries in attendance, which is something we worry about, was that people would say, who? And that trip to the CTO really changed my mind. I thought it's ignorant of us to not know who he, who he is, because down in Brazil, he's, I said, he's like Frank Lloyd Wright is in America. Everybody knows, you know, everybody knows Bully Marx in Brazil. And so I think that we've, we've made our impact this summer through Edward, through Raymond, through our great team here, just if we could move the needle just a little bit further forward on that knowledge. And this, today's symposium will do that further. Uh, today's talks will focus not only on his extraordinary garden design, but also his passionate advocacy for the preservation of Brazil's native ecosystems.
um, were presented today by our Humanities Institute and our Adult Education Program. On your way out today, make sure to take our brand new hot off the presses fall winter catalog. Take a class, it's really fun. Landscape design, floral design, homeopathic remedies, forest bathing. There's such a great, great catalog. I, I get it and I just want to do everything that's in it. You'll also see a series of other lectures and symposia that you can attend through the fall. Um, also, this weekend uh, is the final weekend. No, I guess we have one more on the 29th, but it, we've, we're running, you can take this as the Cinema Brasilico, which is films about Burley Marx, about um, Margaret Mee and the Moonflower. This weekend especially is Amazonia, The Awakening of Florestania, a beautiful film. So if any of you are free, have extra time, or are inspired by the talks today to learn even more about this topic, I encourage you to come back this weekend. We will, our three distinguished speakers today will, will speak in succession, and then the three of them, as you can tell, will come up here in conversation. Our first speaker, Gareth Doherty, is Associate Professor of Landscape Architecture and Director and, Mas and Director of the Master in Landscape Architecture programs at Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. Welcome, Gareth. Luisa Valle is a doctoral candidate in art history at CUNY, the Graduate Center, and her research focuses on Latin American architecture and its implications for art production from the region, with a special interest in local, national, and global contexts of modernism. Welcome, Luisa. And Bruno Carvalho is professor of Romance Languages and Literature and African and African American Studies, also at Harvard, affiliate professor at the Graduate School of Design and co-director of the Harvard Mellon Urban Initiative. Um, we're grateful to the Mellon Foundation for their support of our Humanities Institute, um, a, a, a sort of an environmental humanities arm that connects the dots between the three prongs of the New York Botanical Gardens programs, which are science, we were founded by scientists, most people don't know that, science, horticulture and education. And a day like today, today really neatly weaves that all together. So enjoy the morning. Um, lunch is good here at our, at our um, restaurant. So we had, spend the day. It's really nice when people spend the day with us. So we're, we're glad you're here. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for the invitation to be here, and thank you all for coming. The title of my talk is, The Garden Has Left the Hand of the Gardener, and this is a quote directly from Roberto Bertie Marx. But I wanted to give the first word to Roberto himself. What do you prefer to do, a garden for a couple or a garden for a city? I would tell you I prefer to create a garden for a city because I know that many people could and have the right to use that space, to have a dignifying way of living. <laughs> very much preoccupied with what, what is happening in Brazil. I think I do what I can to preserve and to give towards people more uh, balanced life. I'm always speaking against what I think it is wrong. And that is my way of being. Yeah, I wouldn't be a Roberto if I wouldn't uh, do that. I think we have an ethic in our life, how we conduct our lives. I think we don't conduct our life only to, to, to be happy, but uh, we need to think that we are dependent of other people and we want that other people uh, ought to have the right of living in a balanced way. <laughs> 
I love, I love this vignette, um, not just because we see Roberto relaxing in his home, um, drinking a caipirinha, but because it, it, it offers a great insight into his spirit, his strength of character, and his approach to landscape architecture. R Roberto tells us that if he had to choose between designing a private garden or a public garden, he would choose the public one, as many people could and would use that space to have a dignified way of living. Roberto saw the profession as an ethical concern, a form of activist practice through which he could affect wider societal change. What I like most is that he offered his professional work as a way of balancing society. So he saw the role of the landscape architect as someone who is deeply engaged with bringing about a more just, more just and balanced cities. In this sense, his landscape architecture was an instrument of his activism. My comments today are largely based on a book I edited, Roberto Bernie Mark's lectures. It's a collection of a dozen or so lectures that Roberto gave over about 30 years on various international speaking tours. Most of them have had not been published in English before. I had spent the summer of 1996 in his office. It was a couple of years after he passed away. And I had seen this BBC program in my home in Ireland, and I was totally entranced by Bertie Marx. And so I wrote to his office. I said, you know, I, I love Bertie Marx's work. Can I come in and work for you? And surprisingly, I had a fax from Haruoshi Ono, who said, please come. And so I went to Rio. It was kind of crazy. I, I, I went to Rio, I went to the office, and they said, no, no, we don't want you to work in the office. We want you to experience Roberto. And so for the next two to three months, I was based in Rio. I would go every day to the office. But I wasn't working on projects. I was going through boxes in the archive reading notes, looking at sketches that Roberto made. And I think really importantly, their maintenance team, because the office had a maintenance team, and they would bring me to their various gardens and I got to experience them and to, to pace them and to talk to the owners. And so I learned a lot about Roberto in that time. I think it was interesting too that the office was in a house in Rio and the house the parlor was a meeting room. Uh, there was still a functioning kitchen. And everyone would come together at lunchtime in the dining room and we would eat lunch on a, with a tablecloth that was designed by Roberto. Uh, but it's, this was a tradition that he had um, throughout his life. He had a very generous uh, spirit. But when I was leaving, and because I didn't have much Portuguese at the time, it's marginally better now, um, Haroshi photocopied every lecture he could find that Roberto had given in English and presented them to me as a way of, he told me, bringing something of Roberto with me. This is a picture of Roberto speaking at the American Society of Landscape Architects in, in 1985. The quote, design for people, is very apt. Now, Roberto is not really well known for his uh, uh, interest in cities. And for me, that is the single most important uh, aspect that comes through from these lectures. As I was preparing for the talk and, and reading the lectures again, I found myself reflecting on the significance of Roberto's work and how his work and his words, his actions, and intentions are still incredibly relevant for landscape architecture today. So as I talk over the next few minutes, I invite you to speculate on how Roberto has impacted you or how he might impact you in the future. His style is so personal in a way it's very difficult to emulate without copying or without thinking you're copying. And I think it's more interesting to ask what we can learn from his landscape architecture over and above formal concerns.
So over the next few minutes, I, I would like to focus on how Roberto's activist spirit has impacted his approach to landscape architecture in three ways. Uh, the first is through changing the face of landscape architecture in Brazil. Secondly, through his botanical conservation and propagation of, of plants. And third, through Roberto's intention to bring radical change to cities and society. And in a way, these represent three stages of his life. And in doing so, I want to clarify the title, which we see coming from this lecture, the postscript to a lecture, um, where he said, the garden has left the hand of the gardener. So it's well known that from an early age, Roberto was interested in plants and flowers and experimented in the family garden. He trained as a painter in Germany in the late 1920s, where he was first confronted with the idea of using Brazilian plants in Brazilian gardens, and he began to experiment with that, treating the garden as an art event, juxtaposing colors, textures, volumes, and forms. He tells us in the lectures over and over again, you cannot understand a plant by itself, but always in relation, in association with another. Roberto received his first landscape architecture commission in 1932, at the age of 23, as a result of Lucio Costa visiting the family garden. Now, Lucio Costa was a neighbor of Bernie Marx. He was also the dean of the School of Fine Arts in Rio, where Roberto was studying painting, painting, and he later went on to be the planner of Brasilia. Costa invited Roberto to design a garden for a house he was designing for a family called Schwartz, in collaboration with the architect Gregory Warachevic. The Schwartz Garden led to Bernie Marx's appointment as director of parks in Recife, the capital of Pernambuco state, through a similar serendipitous encounter. The governor of Pernambuco was passing by Bernie Marx's house and he looked over the fence at the garden and he was so impressed apparently that he asked who had designed this and he left a message for Roberto to come and meet him at the Copacabana Palace Hotel. And on that meeting, he invited him to become director of parks and gardens, where he designed his first series of public projects. And this is, this is one of them. Roberto included water features in the parks, and in the Praça de Casa Forci, he included water lilies with their six foot wide leaves for the first time in a public space in Brazil. In another park, he created a cactus garden that didn't need much irrigation. His references came from Garten Schönheit, the German gardening magazine, rather than from traditional European, the, the traditional European garden and park tradition common in Brazil at that time. And this brought him praise and critique in, in equal measure. And th this is a part by, by Glasio, which, although included Brazilian plants, still had a, a very formal uh, European uh, appearance. <coughs> Traces of the parks exist to this day, although as with many of Bernie Marx's projects, they have not been maintained as well as he might have hoped. Like many young designers, Roberto wanted to show the breadth of his knowledge and I put everything he knew into their design. Into the designing of these, I put everything I knew, he said. In a lecture. <laughs> but in a newspaper article following the same lecture, reports that when speaking of this early work, Roberto admitted that he did a salad, but he didn't do a garden. And throughout his life, he, he kept saying that the, the challenge in landscape architecture is to edit your work. So he said he became much better at editing later in life. He came to realize that although the Brazilian flora is among the richest in the world, the flora was avoided by landscape architects. Although we know that the Brazilian flora is one of the richest and most surprising in the world, our plant vocabulary for gardens up to the first quarter of the century was exceedingly small, he said. His activism was not merely about protest, although he liked to protest. 
It's an expanded role for the landscape architect in civil society in which the landscape architect is proactive in environmental conservation and applies this sensibility in designing new landscapes. Through fieldwork, especially with, Melo, with the Brazilian botanist and plant collector Melo Barreto, he actively collected plants for conservation and also for use in his gardens. In this sense, his fieldwork was about action as well as discovery. In a lecture at the function of the garden, he tells us that the landscape architect has a duty to respect what we have and perpetuate by means of seed collections, nurseries, transplanting of seedlings, grafting, layering, etc., so as to provide us with the aesthetic and ethical sense of existence. This is his um, nursery where he, he propagated and uh, many of the plants that he uh, took back from his expeditions. In fact, over 30 plants now bear his name. This is, I think, his favorite. I think it was mine, too, the Heliconia Bernie Marxii. Hiroshi Ono told me that it wasn't uncommon for Roberto to design a garden and, and, to, and to lay out the plants, which he would often do on site. So that although they'd draw the plants, he would go to the site and say, no, no, let's change. And only after the garden is, is planted that he realized that the plants were actually named after him. Which I think is an, an incredible thing. But Murdy Marx saw it as incumbent upon the landscape architect to engage in seeking social envir and environmental justice. His many plant hunting expeditions exposed him firsthand to environmentally destructive practices that, as we know, tragically persist to this day. He saw it as part of his duty as a landscape architect to challenge these practices. Throughout his life, he protested against the demolition of the Amazon and the eradication of native Brazilian flora from their habitats. In a lecture, The Garden is a Form of Art, he asser asserts it's for the landscape architect to try and prevent the destruction of the natural countryside. And he capitalized on his celebrity in Brazil to campaign against the loss of indigenous flora. But the relationship of Bernie Marx's work with the city is a central theme in the lectures, especially in the later versions of the lectures. He paints a picture of himself not just as a romantic botanist and artist, but as an avowed urbanist who saw a distinct role for landscape architecture within the contemporary city. He links what he termed the city garden, which I think is a beautiful term, to the urban question. He sought to create beautiful spaces that also served a wider social purpose. Although he sees a distinction between green areas and cities, his words might not seem as radical today as they were when he said them, because landscape architecture has come much closer to Bernie Marx's point of view in the integration of matters of landscape, ecology, art, and urban design. Here we see a title, Landscape Expert Wants to Color Cities Green. But he didn't, want to just, he didn't just want to color cities green, he wanted to create spaces that people would use. And these photographs are by fantastic Brazilian photographer uh, Leonardo Finotti, whose works illustrate the, the, um, the book of lectures. But Roberto designed a huge number of public spaces over his lifetime. They range from small plazas to the Parque del Este, Flamengo Park, and the iconic Copacabana beachfront. Um, this is a, a square in, in Salvador de Bahia. Uh, it was designed in, in the 1950s. It was just recently restored. And here we see the Largo de, de Carioca in, in Rio from 1981. In, in many ways, the, his, his uh, work, um, some people say that you know, he, he did something and it worked, and he kept doing the same thing again and again. And I think it's, in many ways, quite fantastic. 
This is a Flamengo Park uh, in Rio, which is a, a, a major landfill site. And here is the iconic Copacabana beachfront, uh, where Bertie Marx designed the, the paving pattern between the buildings and the, and the beach. And it's this amazing three mile long tapestry that takes its scale, not so much from the human body, but from the landscape around it. I think that's what makes it so powerful. And I love these images because you can't really tell where the paving pattern ends and where the rocks begin. But what was interesting about uh, his work is that he used um, not just indigenous Brazilian plants, and he used, also used plants from Africa and so on, but the paving material was the uh, basalt sets which were so common in, in um, Portuguese paving and was so common in Brazil at that time. And he adapted them for contemporary use. I think one of the most significant passages in his lectures is included as a postscript. He said, in New York or even in Rio de Janeiro, the neon signs, the advertising posters, the traffic lights, the lighting of parkways, these are not problems which can be ignored. From these are born a new aesthetic. He states in the postscript to the garden as a form of art. If Bertie Marsh were working today, one wonders how his play with the new aesthetics, inclu including colors, forms, sounds, textures, and volumes, neon lights, traffic lights, could be applied to the contemporary city. With the neon signs and traffic lights maybe becoming the vegetation of the garden of the city. I wanted to end with this slide. Um, it's a lecture that he probably gave at Harvard Graduate School of Design in 1985. I, I can't be absolutely sure. Uh, but in it, he, he begins by saying, it may seem strange to you that a landscape gardener from the tropics, and he scored out gardener and he replaced it with architect. And this is his handwriting. And I checked, I'm glad I had a chance to check this with Hariyoshi Ono, who confirmed that Roberto was very sensitive to being called a landscape architect rather than a landscape gardener. One of the reasons for this is that in Brazil at the time, it was common for the architect to, or the professional to come to the house at the front door, but the gardener would be received at the back door of the house, and people never really knew what to do with Roberto. <laughs> but to be a landscape architect in Brazil, you're, um, uh, uh, he well, let me put it another way, he never formally trained as a landscape architect. I'm going uh, tonight to the International Federation of Landscape Architects meeting in Norway, and probably Roberto would never have been admitted because he didn't formally train as a landscape architect, and yet that's what I think is so fantastic about his work, because um, he changed the profession of landscape architecture from the periphery rather than from the center. So thank you very much for your time. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Carrie and Vanessa, for the introduction and the invitation. Thank you, Garrett, for your presentation. And thanks, everyone, for being here today. Uh, it is an honor to speak on the work of Roberto Bule Marx here at the Garden and with Bruno and Garrett, two greatly admired scholars. I would like to thank the Garden and Professor Edward Sullivan for the compelling exhibition on view here at the Garden and for the privilege that I've had in contributing to the catalog of the show. In my essay catalog, I highlight many regionalisms of modernist architecture, whether in Europe, the United States, or Brazil, to challenge both the notion of a single pure European modernism and interpretations of Bruno Marx's medium, nature, as an essential and ahistorical mark of Brazilians' perceived modified modernism. Today, I will build on this argument by discussing instead 
how transdisciplinary, transnational, and transhistorical aspects of in Buda Marx's work remind us of the importance of place and memory for imagining the future. Roberto Bruno Marx imagined a modern Brazilian future by bridging 19th, century, 19th and 20th century art histories, as well as local and global strategies of art making. Influenced by scientific illustrations of Brazilian floral specimens, geometric postulates of modernist architecture, modern art, picturesque painting techniques, and imperial landscape design, Bruno Marx's landscape architecture builds on a history in which nature and culture were never separate entities. Discussions of Bruno Marx's involvement in Brazilian modernism have tended to portray his practice as one of resistance to the global homogenizing powers of European modernity. This heroic interpretation of Bruno Marx's work essentializes the very architectural practice that it seeks to promote by creating a center-periphery dichotomy and by separating regionalism and modernism. My presentation today questions these outdated interpretations of Bruno Marx's work, which I contend are, lim are limited by Eurocentric and nation-centric perspectives that essentialize and dehistoricize his medium, nature. I propose, instead, I propose that fusing nature and culture, history and modernity, European and Brazilian art, landscape and architecture, Bruno Marx's work reminds us of the importance of memory, the importance of history to, con to construct a future for Brazil and the world. Bruno Marx discovered his interest in landscape design during his two years as a student in Weimar, Germany, uh, between 1928 and 1930. The artist was inspired by visits to the Dallin Botanical Garden and Museum, where he wandered during his breaks from his studies in Berlin. At the Dallin, Bruno Marx saw carefully cultivated plants that grew wild in Brazil. Home to the Flora Brasiliensis project, a long study of Brazilian flora, the Dallin was especially rich in Brazilian plants and scientific materials. German botanist Carl Friedrich von Marches and the zoologist Johann von Spix were sent by the Emperor of Austria, Francisco I, on a scientific expedition to Brazil in 1817. They traveled about 6,000 miles into the country's hinterland and returned to Germany carrying close to 20,000 botanical specimens that would serve as the basis for the Flora Brasiliensis study. August Eichler, former director of the Berlin Botanical Garden, acquired the project in 1868, and the Flora Brasiliensis survey continued until 1906. Bruno Marx immersed himself in treatises and specimens of Brazilian flora in the archives of the Dalin. But as important as Bruno Marx's botanical excursions were his encounters with works by the European avant-garde and the history of European art and architecture displayed in the German capital. In this self-portrait of 1929, Bruno Marx indicates his interest in the visual and tactile effects of Cubism and German Expressionism, such as in the work's articulation of geometric planes and volumes, and dramatic, dramatic modulation of light and shade, and cropped composition. Bruno Marx would continue to elaborate on these experiences in, the, in his gardens, which infuse elements of European art with local history, aesthetic, and political concerns, to develop a Brazilian modern cultural identity. When Bruno Marx returned to Brazil in 1930, he enrolled at the National School of Beaux Arts in Rio de Janeiro. Founded in 1826 as the Imperial Academy of Beaux Arts, the school was modeled on the neoclassical principles of the, Ac the Académie des Beaux Arts in Paris. Yet, the Brazilian school differed in one crucial way from other contemporary art academies. In addition to instructing sculpture and painting techniques, its curriculum included a course focused on landscapes, flowers, and animals, emphasizing the significance of the native fauna and flora in codifying Brazilian cultural identity. 
As a fine art student at the school, Boulay Marx encountered works of 19th century landscape painters, landscape painters such as Félix Émile Tonnet, who became director of the Imperial Academy in 1834 and played a significant role in the school's visual creation of the new nation. In Guanabara Bay from, the Sna from Snake Island that you see up here, uh, Tone deploys important symbols in shaping Brazil's image. Painting from the perspective of Snake Island, an important military site in Rio, Tone indicates the sovereignty of the recently independent country. Displaying fruits and trees, the composition recalls Brazil's main industries at the time, agriculture and logging. In the bottom left side of the composition, Tony identifies the figures as slaves by their skin color and bare feet. Yet, the lighthearted rendering of their activity, dancing while harvesting and transporting fruits and other materials, naturalized slavery while demonstrating Brazil's labor, po labor power and artistic academicism. The artist also adjusts the height and shape of Rio's iconic Corcovado and Sugarloaf Mountains and regularizes the architectural shapes and colors of the buildings that frame the Guanabara Bay. By taming the exuberance of the local natural landscape and hiding signs of brutality and disorder in the Brazilian capital, Tone adopted representational tropes of picturesque landscape painting to create an image of Brazil that appealed to lo local and foreign audiences. Boulay Marx would also create regularizing principles to display and articulate Brazil's natural landscape. Yet, by rendering explicit the artificiality of his man-made landscape architecture, Boulay Marx eschewed the concealed regularity of picturesque representations of the Brazilian natural environment. First registered as an architecture student, Boulay Marx switched to the fine arts track at the suggestion of architect and urban planner Lucio Costa, then director of the School of Beaux Arts, and who would become Boulay Marx's close collaborator over the next several decades. <coughs> During his short term as director, Costa challenged the school's academicism by opening its doors to Brazil's modernist avant-garde. His reinvention of the academy culminated in the Revolutionary Salon, the nickname given by the press to the 1931 iteration of the school's official salon, until then dominated by academic painters. The salon introduced, this, this introduced students to the works to works by the Brazilian avant-garde, such as The Market Two by Tarsila do Maral and Moonlight Two Brothers by Ismael Neri, with influences in purism, industrial cubism, expressionism, surrealism, and the metaphysical school. Despite the students' great enthusiasm with the show, Boulay Marx in included, the revolutionary salon caused tremendous internal pushback, and the school board ousted Costa from his position in the same month that the show opened to the public. Later, Costa and Boulay Marx would together help shape the synthesis of the arts of official Brazilian modernism. Building on 19th century discussions of Gesamtkunstwerk, or the total work of art, modernist theories on the synthesis of the arts called for the integration of architecture with the fine arts within a single project. Boulay Marx's 1931 design for the rooftop garden of the Alfredo Schwartz residence, designed by Costa and Gregory Varchavchek, exemplifies his merge of nature and artif artifice, representation and architecture, passive contemplation, and active bodily experience. The geometric regularity of the plan, a series of perfect circles framed by a rectangular garden bed over a grid, echoed the rationalist postulates of the house's modernist architecture. It evoked the geometric abstraction of European modernism while appealing to the interest of the Brazilian avant-garde in cubism, constructivism, Bauhaus, and Corbusian architecture. The mixed vegetation planted in the circular terraces flaunted the irregularity of the native flora, which in contrast with the tactic of isolating specimen plants on the pages of scientific volumes, created an expressionist eruption of different shapes, sizes, textures, and colors. Bulle Marx's landscape plan for the Schwartz House simultaneously engaged and transformed 
strategies of the European and Brazilian avant-garde, the history of scientific expeditions to Brazil, and the artificial naturalism of picturesque, of picturesque landscapes to create an original and Brazilian brand of modernism characterized by the synthesis of the arts. <clears throat> Working with a team of Brazilian architects led by Costa and, and, Le and Le Corbusier as a consultant, in 1938, Moulemarx designed the iconic elevated garden of the, Ministry of, Education, of the former Ministry of Education and Public Health Building. The plan shows a series of amoebic-shaped amoebic garden beds interweaved by the sinuous curves of pedestrian paths seen here in this beautiful brush rendering of a, of a narrow view of the project. Architectural historian Valerie Fraser interpreted the plan as an allusion to the wetlands of the Amazon to argue that Bulemarx, de, that Bulemarx deliberately challenged the rationalist postulates of the building's Corbusian architecture by testing Le Corbusier's law of the meander. Le Corbusier, Le Corbusier developed the law of the meander as a corrective measure to what he saw as a crisis, or the irrational curves of the rivers that he saw when flying over the South American continent. Similarly, Italian architect Bruno Zevi argue, argued that Boulemarx's adoption of a Baroque vocabulary in his landscape design had salvaged modern Brazilian architecture from its hasty adoption of a Corbusian model. Both Frazier's and Zavi's interpretations of Bolemarx's elevated garden were problematic. I'm going to skip this one. Uh, they offered a pluralist formalist assessment based on what they interpreted as essentially Brazilian. Uh, and by understanding the project in opposition to the work of Le Corbusier, they dismissed the fact that Boulemarx's landscape architecture was steeped into Brazil's cultural history and modern inquiry, from the artifice of 19th century landscape painting and design to the political and aesthetic concerns of his time, in which modernist architecture and the synthesis of the arts play a significant role. Still, Austrian-American architect Richard Neutra, who had a lifelong relationship with Bolle Marx, once complimented his friend's work by saying, quote, I find no roots of the past in your art, end of quote. Like Zevi and Fraser, Neutra took a Eurocentric perspective in viewing Bolle Marx's landscape design and medium, nature, as an essential and ahistorical signifier of Brazilian cultural identity. Yet, the ambivalence that Boulemarx articulated in the simultaneous endlessness and cropping of the sinuous lines of his ministry plan recalled strategies used in the romantic garden design of the Quinta da Boa Vista, one of the most important sites of Brazilian cultural history. Donated, by Don Juan VI in 18, do, donated to Don Juan VI in 1808, the Quinta da Boa Vista was home to the Portuguese royal family until 1889. The grounds and manor of the state, the São Cristóvão, Pel São Cristóvão Palace, underwent countless renovations over the years. In 1868, Emperor Dom Pedro II commissioned Auguste Glazier, a French botanist and hydraulic, hydraulic engineer, to redesign the Quintas Gardens. Appointed director of Imperial Gardens, Glazier used local tropical flora, which he himself had collected, in several designs for plazas and streetscapes in Rio, of Rio, in Rio. In fact, Glazier contributed with some 12,000 uh, specimens of Brazilian flora to the Flora Brasiliensis project at the Dallin. Bulle Marx also, oh, okay, at the Quinta, sorry, at the Quinta, Glazio laid out a picturesque garden of curvilinear paths punctuated by bodies of water, grottoes, and large boulders, which he used to delineate the sharp edges of his composition. Boulemarx also paid special attention to spatial definition in his gardens and often used natural boulders as devices for doing so. Glazio flanked the rectilinear driveway leading to the palace with native sapucaia trees. <clears throat> the, the trees' pink leaves and purple flowers rendered the entrance to the palace 
a design natural spectacle. Similarly, Boulemax's brush rendering of the ministry's garden deployed con color to create effect. However, the flowing sinuous lines and harmony of color of Boulemax's two-dimensional plan revealed that his engagement was as much with Brazil's imperial past as it was with local and global modernisms. I, I'm showing this up, I, and here I can fall into my, my own trap of, uh, of my critique of Frazier and Zavi in, my, in, in, in doing a formalist uh, comparison. But, they are, but the work of Jean Arp, uh, his absurd constructs of form and color and understanding of volume, and Tarsila's um, gestural quality of, in, in her, the gestural quality of Tarsila's imaginative landscape designs are here to make a point about this transhistorical and uh, transnational quality of Bruno Marx's very multifaceted influences and, and production, and not so much to make a direct formal um, uh, comparison. Because Boulemax's plan for the elevated garden of the ministry appropriated and transformed strategies of art making of European and Brazilian modernisms, imperial landscape design, and infused it with the aesthetic and political interests of, interests of his time to imagine a modern future for Brazil. After the proclamation of the Republic in 1889, the São Cristóvão Palace, uh, which housed the collection of the National Museum, and the gardens of the Quinta were open to the public. Incorporated into the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro in 1946, by 2018, the museum accumulated invaluable research initiatives on lost languages, cultures, and peoples and a collection of more than 20 million items, including African, Egyptian, and Etruscan artifact, artifacts, fossils, specimens of plants, butterflies, and insects, a library of over 200,000 volumes, and Lucy, the oldest human fossil in the Americas. In a critical state of disrepair, due to the vertiginous decrease in its governmental funding, on September 2, 2018, just over a year ago, the National Museum burned to the ground. Its ruins, surrounded by Glazier's garden, stand as a memento mori to what Brazilian anthropologist Eduardo Viveiros de Castro defined as, quote, the destruction of memory, the destruction of history, end of quote. The synthesis of rationalist principles of architecture with landscape design at the Quinta and at the Ministry creates a, a historical arc between the two projects. Today, Boulemax's gardens at the, former Ministry of of, at the former Ministry of Education building remain as a memorial to the lost synthesis of, lands of designed landscapes at the Quinta. By deploying native flora as a tool in the struggle for the codification of a modern Brazilian cultural identity, Boulemax's landscape architecture reminds us of the entanglement of culture and nature in Brazil. From the struggle of native peoples and natural environments to survive the country's history of colonialist destruction, to the threats against the Amazon forest by Brazil's current administration. Last month, President Jair Bolsonaro gave land poachers green light to slash and burn areas of the Amazon, invaded, invading protected indigenous territory, and displacing communities to plant pasture. These criminal actions are the consequence of a long history of leaders who promoted the Brazilian landscape as the image of the country while supporting projects of settlement and development that required its destruction. Such as in Tonet's uh, picturesque painting of the cutting and burning of Rio's Tijuca forest by the logging industry that you see on the background here. Using devices of European landscape painting, Tonet represents Rio's forest as both a visually sublime and lucrative resource. The current fires in the Amazon region not only signal to the importance of Bule Marx's pioneering environmental activism, but also reminds us of the impact of his modernist practice. <clears throat> 
Le um, last week, Professor, I think it was last week in the New York Times, Professor Minga, uh, Minga very recently, Professor Minga Bira Unger warned us a type, against a type of, environment, of environmentalism that consoles our disappointment with history by objectifying, depopulating, and romanticizing what he calls, quote, the great garden of nature, end of quote. Bule Marx's modernism counters this type of escapist and reductive understanding of the, nat of the natural environment by engaging, nat engaging with nature, in by engaging nature and culture, history and modernity, European and Brazilian art, landscape and architecture. Bule Marx's modernism challenges the inscription of his media nature as an essential and a historical <coughs> symbol of Brazilianness by revealing that there is nothing natural in the representation and articulation of nature. Instead, Bula Marx's work involves a series of complex historical choices and mediations that remind us of the importance of memory, the importance of history for, ima for imagining the future of the nature, culture, and people of Brazil and the world. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm deeply honored to be here with all of you, with Louisa, Gareth. I wanted to thank Vanessa, Carrie, all the folks in the garden for welcoming us so kindly into this very beautiful uh, space. I wanted to thank everyone involved with the exhibit too, and Bula Marx for bringing us all together. And. Let me start with um, the title. I should, I should explain what I mean by, by, by skills of belonging. So we can think of cultural pol political dynamics as, as often tied to questions of what we belong to, where we belong, how we belong. Um, and we can think you know, of this, we can frame this in sort of spatial or identitary terms, right? So you know, we can start with a household, neighborhood, to a town, a state, a region. Um, a nation, a global community, the cosmos, um, or uh, um, a family, an ethnic group, a racial group, a political uh, group, a unity, uh, a union, um, uh, you know, profession, religion, and, and so on and so forth. And I think it's, it's a particularly pressing issue for life in an urbanized world, um, something we as a species have, of course, not been doing, haven't been doing for uh, all that long. Um, and here's one that is a, uh, yeah. Um, because in modernity, uh, belonging has been less binding than experiences in tribal societies or in village life, for example, right? All, all that is solid melts into air. Um, we might define the modern urban experience, the modern urban condition of the last 150 years or so as, as the experience of living among strangers, which is of course something we take for, for granted now. Um, and of course, as we know, the, the imagined community of the nation where strangers share uh, an identity or a set of concerns or laws or references or whatever as Brazilians or Irish and so on, um, has been rather central through uh, much of the past century or so, certainly during Bolle Marx's period. And though this seemed to be shaken up in the 90s, it's certainly been reasserted through various forms of hypernationalism, illiberal democracies, authoritarian populism, or however we want to name um, uh, Bolsonaro and uh, his equivalents elsewhere in the world. So most of Bruno Marx's career happened during a period we sometimes call nationalist developmentalist, right? It sort of refers to a set of social economic policies uh, based on active uh, state uh, participation in industrialization and infrastructure development uh, towards uh, national GDP growth. Um, in Brazil, this was a, 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 a component of this was the construction of Brasilia, inaugurated in 1960 and the integration of the Amazon to regional and national transportation networks. And you see Brazilia at the bottom of this uh, map, sort of part of this nexus, which was meant to 
bring, bring the Amazon sort of into the national uh, fold. Um, so in this broader context, where Lamarck's landscape architecture stands apart for mobilizing a different set of forms of being and belonging, which foreground embodied apprehensible scales, so uh, bodies, pathways, planes, as well as the planetary um, earth systems, uh, ecologies. So when uh, our authoritarians make successful appeals to a sense of belonging to an idea of a nation rather than any particular place, Perhaps Bruno Mach's work can help us to cultivate alternative forms and scales of belonging grounded on the territorial parks, gardens, cities, ecosystems, so various scales, and the experiential as opposed to the more imagined and abstract modes of identity and their fantasies of stability, right, where individuals might be reducible to, to single uh, variables or single identities, be they national, uh, class, racial, uh, professional, or, or even juridical, right, um, um, as, as we do with uh, uh, immigrants often as illegals or um, even undocumented. So we can start with Pugel Marx's own dynamism as a practitioner, right, he was a, a singer, a, a painter, a writer, a landscape architect, a collector, a cataloger of uh, plans, um, and so on. But um, back to the big picture for Louvain. So, so Bonamart lived through a period of very intensive urbanization in Brazil. You might remember from that graph that uh, Brazil is, is, is among the most urban uh, places uh, um, in, in the planet. And it was a period when various infrastructural projects were conceived with these regional, national, continental scales in mind, right? often linking uh, extractive uh, frontiers to major metropolitan centers in pursuit of modern futures. And here uh, there should be all sorts of echoes with Luisa's wonderful um, talk. So whereas the built futures imagined in this modern past had been marked by a sense of possibilities uh, malleable geographies, uh, engineered landscapes, our own um, contemporary condition seems to be increasingly defined by uh, seemingly fixed, intractable uh, uh, futures of environmental limits or urban and climate crises. And here you'll see that um, um, uh, uh, the, the fires which follow uh, uh, deforestation very much uh, uh, follow the road which you saw, the roads which you saw in the previous map. So, Bruno Marx belongs to this earlier moment, it seems, or earlier than our own, marked by uh, hopeful futures uh, to work towards rather than apocalyptic futures to avert or mitigate. Um, Brazil had a series of versions of this from uh, uh, this president, this was the president who uh, uh, was responsible for Brasilia being built. The slogan was 50 years in five. During the military dictatorship, the slogan was Great Brazil. Um, so, of course, these hopes of the past are what led us to, to um, our own condition, but I do think it's important to differentiate them from uh, what Bolsonaro, for example, is, is been doing, which is much more of an undoing than something um, uh, with any type of uh, future in the horizon. So, and, and here I think we can begin to, to review the themes of innovation and activism, right? Uh, landscape architecture could be uh, uh, part of, of, of the inventing and making of better urban futures, the creation of cities to which we can belong, where we can belong with others, um, including fauna and flora. We, we might say that to Bruno Marx, we ought to belong primarily on Earth, not, not the world or global as metaphors for international affairs or interconnectedness, uh, certainly not the escaped fantasies of Mars, which are now being um, revived, uh, but this planet uh, with its dazzling variety of life forms and topographies. Um, many of them now under threat. And this is a photo, uh, uh, I, I haven't identified the photos. They're either come, it'll be clear when they come from promotional materials, but the ones that don't are my own. Um, and I should say, uh, so this is the Sichu, which is sort of Bruno Marx estate. Uh, a lot of the public uh, uh, parks of Bruno Marx in Rio are uh, particularly abandoned uh, uh, as we speak. There was just a, a piece in the global uh, newspaper just last week. 
on that, that a lot of it are becoming sort of parking lots and are just not being maintained just as a, as a parenthesis. Um, so to, to Bulamax, besides Earth, we of course belong in, in our bodies, uh, but the attention in Bulamax with the body is not placed on any higher truths, but rather on outer surfaces, right? And the mediations between our embodied uh, sensorial apparatus and the materiality of our surroundings, right? On the joyous, uh, lively engagement, uh, uh, sensual engagement with topography and plant life, which is why I think this uh, photograph in the uh, uh, cover of the exhibit is so uh, uh, evocative and so um, um, beautiful. So Bonamax plays with uh, scales all the times, uh, at all times. Right? He often refers to the relationships between his gardens and paintings, for example, with the territory or topography as a surface for the composition. Um, we might think that if his gardens mediate between bodies, um, both uh, humans and plants and um, landscapes, his public parks mediate between individuals and political communities. They become places where strangers might belong together, even if momentarily. And this is, of course, a photograph of uh, the, the Flamengo Park during Carnival. Um, and of course, the, those of us who work as cultural historians, uh, 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 cities sort of give constant evidence of how throughout the history of planning, the unplanned and the improbable happen uh, all, the, all the time. And uh, in, in the case of the Max Parks, the public ones are all sorts of uh, appropriations which he certainly didn't foresee. So this is, this underpass becomes the site of, uh, um, uh, you know, live music and sort of fairly uh, sometimes impromptu um, uh, uh, parties. So um, an urgent question for me is, uh, sort of, to some extent, what Max aside, um, the, the urban forms and spatial logics of the globalized world, so saturated with telecommunications technologies, um, gated communities, widespread segregation, uh, often miserable and long commutes, uh, especially for the poor, uh, these conditions all seem to lend themselves to social lives mediated by screens. What happens when screens displace streets or public spaces as the primary interface for democracy? Well, uh, contemporary Brazil might be providing us with a few initial and terrifying answers. Um, and, and I'll open this parenthesis just to bring everybody up to date who hasn't been plugged into um, uh, what, what, what's some of some what's, what's happening. So, so last year in Brazilian elections, one of the most recurrent tropes was the idea that only Bolsonaro and his allies could save uh, the children from government issue gay kits to be distributed in schools. This, this was a false claim, uh, reproduced without regard to reference. And I think that's the important part. According to polls, over 80% of his voters believed in it. So we now have a, a similar uh, dynamic with forest fires in Amazonia now. Right? A significant number of Bolsonaro supporters are swayed by memes claiming that either there aren't any actual fires or purporting to show NGO members starting fires to make the government look bad abroad. Um, so it's as if the uh, image, the representation, it's as if it's the image or the representation which triggers and drives the socioeconomic processes and the political forces, rather than the material realities to which the images supposedly refer to. Right? And these, to those that you know, study architectural design and, and, and cultural theory and so on, are things we've discussed and have called post-modernity or the society of the spectacle. Um, but I think there's, there are symptoms of this in a kind of landscape architecture that I'd like to contrast to Bohle Marx's. Um, his work, I think, can act as an antidote to a type of design which seems to be chiefly concerned with circulation as image, um, as digital rendering, uh, as photographs, where the image, the representation, matters more than the actual territory and the living beings that comprise it. We find an example in the award-winning a uh, public park in a diverse immigrant neighborhood in Copenhagen, uh, completed in 2012. So Big and um, Company seemed to prioritize um, images over embodied experiences as if urban development 
had become more about the pitch than the place. So here in the rendering, the trees were foregrounded, um, and this looks, this looks impressive, this uh, spectacular, even. Um, permeability, durability weren't, uh, are, are overlooked in this particular project, right? So these actual trees uh, seem to die um, every two years. They're surrounded by impermeable materials. Uh, this, you know, this in a city which uh, uh, seems to carry on no matter what the weather, uh, isn't a particularly fun place um, when it rains. Of course, Bruno Marx always, was always concerned with the, the, the flow of water. Here, the, the red fades rapidly, the surfacing has had to be replaced. Uh, and of course, there's so much Copenhagen does right in its planning design, uh, which is sort of part of the point, I think, of uh, uh, choosing an example um, from there, too. There will be a lot of analogous examples in Rio from uh, Olympic urbanism over the last um, few years. Um, so, you know, elsewhere in this park, these are uh, identified as Chinese palm trees. So it's sort of this deterritorialized, these plants are deterritorialized, recontextualized as an abstraction, signifying multiculturalism as a representation of China. Um, as, in this case, this outdoor boxing ring does for Thailand. Uh, neither of these particularly suited to the Danish climate, um, of course. The, the palm trees, in fact, have to be covered for much of the year. So um, these sort of aerial perspectives, which are so uh, uh, privileged in a lot of representation of um, contemporary projects and design, are, of course, to some extent, extent themselves uh, disembodied. Nobody experiences these places from um, these angles, unless as an image. Um, we could say something similar about Boulay Marx's paintings, but they're, of course, not meant to be uh, figurative or faithful representations of um, plans. So in, in Superkillen, and, and uh, we know this, uh, the residents had, had wanted uh, uh, the city to provide trees and shades and benches. They got these um, asphalted landscapes, which are basically uh, ready-made for selfies and um, social media. Uh, these are all my own photos. It's not as if I waited around to, uh, you know, take pictures of people taking pictures. These were literally the only people um, there. Uh, so it's a, it's a place that works best essentially as a digital fiction. Um, and it's obviously not as uh, nauseous as the fake news engines dominating so much digital social media scapes. But what I think is important, what I'm trying to get at, is, is this gap between the representation and the empirical, because I think it fits into a broader uh, pattern and a broader um, problem. Um, so the, the scales of belonging in Buena Marx projects, uh, uh, embodied and terrestrial, I think it can work to destabilize nationalist, authoritarian, and binding um, identity formations. Right? How, how do we make a rendering of uh, a Bouddhamax garden or park? They resist the instantaneity, I think, of, of, of media spectacles, of, of fixity itself. Um, in, in a late interview, William Marx spoke of how seeing trees grow gives us the measure of life. And Lauro Cavalcanti and Fahez Eldada have highlighted the phrase permanence of the unstable, which I think gets at this as well. Bouillet Marx's um, landscapes uh, evolve as uh, uh, people do, as plants do, as a single day does, as seasons do, as cities do. And, you know, the, the, in contrast to the big park in, in Copenhagen, uh, it, it works hard to be international, multicultural, you know, sort of references to, to Russia, to Algeria, and so on. Um, but it's a, it's a fairly conventional take on cultural diversity at the scale of, of, of nation and nationhood. Uh, and of course, produces ecologies and cultural references uh, sapped of vitality in a lot of ways, as if we could get diversity from uh, cutting and pasting symbolic references. Um, Bruno Marx, uh, uh, on the other hand, builds on associations and uh, understanding ecological systems. In um, an expedition, he, he refers to relationships between rocks and plants as a society um, in complete reciprocal harmony. In his gardens, he didn't merely replicate uh, but experimented with adapting plants from the most diverse environments, bringing together, uh, quote, representatives from the coastal flora, from the mountain slopes, the Cerrado, Rocky Hills, and the Amazon. 
I'm still quoting, dealing with them, discovering their needs and affinities, learning a little more about the way they live and their life cycle. And this is, of course, also a um, pretty radical uh, and obvious departure from the ways in which early scientific classification systems privileged uh, uh, singularities rather than, than a field of relations. Um, but Lamarck's language uh, doesn't seem to be, I think, about uh, anthropomorphizing plants, but is rather about recognizing agency and intelligence in the non-human, um, or about a scale of belonging that allows for our coexistence in this planet. Uh, but Lamarck certainly mobilized national scales of belonging, too. Uh, uh, Louisa um, also showed that. Um, uh, uh, brilliantly, and um, he could be very practical-minded and strategic about it uh, as well. Uh, uh, he, he worked within the military dictatorship in a dark period of Brazilian history. We've learned so much about this from Catherine Sievert Norrison's brilliant book, Depositions, which I see is uh, for sale um, outside, uh, and which shows how he, quote, insisted that the definition of national, national culture include the Brazilian forest and its diversity of flora as part of the Brazilian national heritage, um, and that this forest, therefore, deserved protective legislation. But um, Max seemed most comfortable with the scales of the embodied um, of his landscapes and plants um, and the planetary. It is, quote, for the landscape architect to try and prevent the destruction of the natural environment, he writes in 1962. But Marx didn't quite break down human nature divides in conceptual terms as we are now uh, often fond of doing, but he did practice a design that in effect blurred uh, uh, the distinction, um, as, as, as he put it, aiming to bring nature into the city and take us back to it. Um, or elsewhere, because uh, urban green areas allow city dwellers to not, quote, feel lost in a mass of concrete. But Max shows a, a constant commitment to, to cities and urbanity, and I think this, this echoes uh, Gareth's talk uh, as well, and, and the task of, of landscape architects of, of bettering both. In 1962, he spoke of how, quote, the inhabitants of our large cities seem to have a decreasing sensibility about understanding nature or the complex web of life that nature sustains. Gardens can be a quote, splendid opportunity to illustrate some of the bewildering variety of nature, to emphasize her prolific capacity to adapt and adjust to changing conditions. Certainly things we better learn from um, as we tackle a climate crisis. Observation of nature, he says, is a tremendous stimulus to the imagination. Nature is an indefatigable teacher. We might think here of Aldo Leopold's um, ethos, we can be ethical only toward what we can see. Um, and just to, to conclude back with uh, Amazon, and I'll add another 15 slides, we'll, we'll uh, uh, leave us leave to a, you know, a different occasion that we're a little bit more historical. So in recent years, ethnobotanists and others have begun to see the Amazonian basin as an engineered landscape of old regrowth forests or mosaics of orchards within a forest matrix. So essentially, uh, planted uh, tree gardens were successfully inhabited and abandoned, and this cycles of settlements, uh, clearings, and regrowth led to increasing biodiversity, leading and creating the forest as we know it. So essentially, said of the Amazonia as an engineered landscape or, or a garden. This wasn't something we remarked was aware of, uh, uh, these discoveries are, are, are fairly recent, but he had intuitions and formed thoughts on plants themselves as social and on our ability to belong um, with them. So we can go back to the title of this panel. William Max rarely frames his solutions as novelties, his innovations as novelties, but rather as part of a process of learning from the environment. So not innovation for its own sake, uh, but often tied to action and turned toward uh, the city and community. My name is Vanessa Sellers. I'm your uh, host of today and the director of the Humanities Institute. And um, we're glad 
when they are microphoned uh, that you will ask some questions. There will be people going around with a microphone, so if you have a question, raise your hand and you will receive a microphone to speak with. Yes, we have a question there in the back. Can you hear me? Oh my goodness, this is so loud. Uh, hi, this was wonderful and so generative. Um, I sort of have a, a, a double question for you all, and you sort of hinted at it throughout your talks. Um, on the one hand, I really would love to hear more about his conservation ethic. Um, it seems to be, from what you were talking about, almost like an ecological model of equilibrium. So I really wanted to hear more about where. Uh, brilliant Mark sort of put humans within that sort of scheme. And then on the other hand, you know, in thinking about his urban spaces, did his choice of flora, the plants that he actually chose, what was he trying to sort of, in a way, catalyze in activism and sort of, in a, in a way, a conservation experience for his visitors in the urban spaces? Thank you. Who would like to take the question? Um, me? Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, I mean, he, when he sought plants, he, he, all, he, and then Bruno just mentioned this, that they're in, they exist in relationship to something else. So when he was cr constructing his urban spaces, it was very much about relationships, his relationships of, of plants to each other, of textures, of colors, of volumes. And so I think he really thought of his spaces in, in that sense. Um, in terms of the conservation efforts, um, I mean, obviously he, he, he felt that, that he had an ethical responsibility uh, to be involved in conservation efforts. He, his whole, um, he had a small farm where he would propagate the plants that were then used in his gardens. But the ultimate decision on which plants that he used in the gardens, I believe, was based more on their volume, on their color, yeah. on their texture, and then their, their relationship to other plants. So I don't think he was really cre recreating a, an ecosystem in, in each of the spaces, if I'm understanding yeah. the, the question correctly. Um, but it was more of a, um, a, an artistic experience. Yes, I, um, there's another question here in front. Yes, um, I wonder uh, if we, you've done a beautiful job of ex describing his influences, his early life and so forth, and I wonder how much I do believe he was influenced by Olmsted, and it seems to me that um, he carried his Olmsted's vision even further, that Olmsted would have appreciated his appreciation for the native flora and so forth, which Olmsted didn't emphasize so much. Um, but I wondered if you could speak to that. Roberta Marx and Olmsted, who would like to take that question? Louisa? Uh, yes, um, there's so many um, interests and influences, and and uh, spaces in which, and, and works, movers that uh, Bruder Marx is, uh, was inspired by, uh, translated in his own uh, personal way, via, through his own personal interests, including Olmsted. I skipped one slide in my presentation in which I was going to talk about uh, the influence of the concrete art movement in Brazil in his work of the 50s, and the more geometric take that it had taken. Um, I could have unpacked a lot more of the everything. I think Garrett has had a slide of like, I put everything I know in my landscapes. The everything he knew was a lot. And um, yes, so absolutely Armstead an influence. And the history of landscape design, which is often dismissed by uh, these more essentialized readings that I was that I was referring to of his work as essentially Brazilian, and therefore we can't talk about uh, the works of, like, oh, the, oh, yeah, the work of, for instance, Olmsted, because we talk, we can't talk about historical reference. We can't talk about his, uh, you know, transnational and transhistorical dialogues. 
So yes, very important. Thank you. There's a gentleman back. Did his design vary from country to country with the, uh, I guess, his artistic view? Like, would he have designed the gardens in New York differently from Brazil? Do you want to answer that one? Well, I actually want to answer the, to the two other questions. <laughs> yeah. Very brief comments, <laughs> just to add, uh, uh, and then I'll pass it on to, to Gareth and Louisa to answer your question, which they'll do a much better job. Uh, so just the first one of conservation efforts. I think it's, it's, it's important to sort of remember how unimaginable some of our concerns were at the times when Burre Marx was speaking against uh, deforestation in, in Amazonia. Um, and for those that have spent time in Amazonia, you quickly begin to understand how folks who live there don't think that it's necessarily all that bad to, to, to slash and burn. The, the presence of the forest often feels sort of overpowering uh, and all-consuming. And, and Buramax, you know, he had a two-month expedition in 83 through roads that you'd get stuck on for several days and weeks. Um, um, and so on. So even in this context of sort of a lot of developmentalist boosterism, that this is something the country needs to do for its sake and for development and so on, before we knew that we're rapidly approaching a tipping point where the Amazonia could be led into saponization and so on, but where Max was already uh, uh, speaking up. And I think there's, there's, you know, I think it's an important thing to sort of remember. Just very quickly with Olmsted, at least my, my sense is that Bude Max is much more of a gregarious uh, uh, landscape architect. His, his parks are never escapes from the city. Right? They're, they're always very sort of, they sort of always maximize uh, uh, public spaces as places of chance encounters as opposed to places for solitary walks where you forget that you're uh, in Manhattan or whatever. Okay, now to the actual question. Uh, well, before I get to answering the question, I, I did want to go back to the Olmsted as well um, because it, clearly, he's influenced by many landscape architects, and we see that in, in his lectures where he talks a little bit. He talks a lot about history, often not always historically correct, but he had an interest. <laughs> he had an interest in history, and yet people would say that he didn't look that closely at the work of other landscape architects. Uh, there are books in his library, um, but the books were given to him by by visitors, um, and that he looked to um, Brazilian culture and to plants and to painting for his references. Um, as to, the, to the, the question about his work outside of Brazil, um, the only project that I've seen outside of Brazil is the Parque do Leste in, in Caracas, uh, which is a, a, a former coffee plantation it's a fantastic project, clearly Bernie Marx. Um, you can tell from the, from the plants, from the spaces, from the details. And the plants were indigenous um, Venezuelan plants um, that he felt were, were used because it would also, not alone for their aesthetic qualities, but also it was more sustainable, for, for one of a better word, uh, to use them in, in, uh, in a Venezuelan park. Um, most of his work is actually in Brazil, but there are other projects, and there's Biscayne Boulevard in Miami, which I've not seen. Um, but to look at it, to look at the pictures, it looks like Bernie Marx. Uh, he also worked in the Longwood Gardens outside of Philadelphia and design projects in, in Berlin and in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, but I think everything I see of Bernie Marx looks like Bernie Marx, too. Mm -hmm. So the early and late stuff also look different, right? Fewer plants later, generally. Yeah, and l later work is more geometric. More geometric, yeah. 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 We have time for one more question, right here in front. Hi, thank you so much. What a great panel. I'm so excited to hear of all the commentaries. Um, I was wanting to get your take on something I've been grappling with when you use the term activist, which is the title of today's session uh, in Burley Marx, because yes, he was an environmental ethicist or activist, but what in your experience and your research do you 
Or how would you, and two as Brazilians, how do you frame his role as a social activist or not? Because I find, or I found in some of his writings and uh, comments, there are, there are moments when environmental activism is at odds with social activism. And we see many of his speeches during the dictatorship uh, in defense of the environment play out while the 10,000 man march is happening simultaneously outside in public spaces. Mm -hmm. And then there's of course the longer, more fraught history of slavery and labor which mm -hmm. plays out until today. And yeah. Louisa's talk as well addresses this. So I was curious as to how you grapple with this word activist in mm -hmm. light of um, an environmental movement which is not, is sometimes at odds with a social movement. Yeah. Um, I, I purposely, uh, put in my talk, uh, environmental activism, mm. which I see as different from social activism. I think, I mean, as much as the environment is culture and is part of society and defines and a lot related to my talk and all that, I put environmental activism. Uh, one part of the Mangabeira Unger article that I did and that I cut out of the talk was then he says that uh, Brazilians don't need consolation uh, they need policies. Mm -hmm. And that's where the activism, uh, uh, I think, resides. And that's where I think Bole Marx's activism, not his environmental ethics no. or aesthetic, but the moment that he, and, and that's a, a push and pull a little bit, the moment that he decided to work for the dictatorship, for the sake of changing policies regarding the Brazilian natural environment, that's environmental activism. Mm -hmm. Yes, as you say, people were disappearing and being killed and tortured mm -hmm. outside of governmental walls. But he was trying to secure an, an activist position uh, mm -hmm. in terms of policies that are necessary to protect the environment. Mm -hmm. So that's how I... Yeah, no, but I use thoughts. I agree with everything with, with Louisa's uh, response. I'd be much more interested in your answer to yes, the question. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I think your, your question, um, uh, the way you framed it, I think already hints at what my own answer would be. But I think the fact that he chose to, uh, uh, there is something that can be understood uh, as, as reactionary in how he chooses his activism to focus on this sort of uh, recovering of a relationship to uh, nature and so on when there are so many other pulsating causes in the 60s, right? So that, instead of urban inequalities being the focus, I think, is something we, we need to, to, yeah, to foreground and, 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 and grapple with, and yeah. Okay, so you wanna add to that? Yeah, well, I would say that, I mean, in his, his you know, I think that one of the points I was trying to make was that uh, he um, brought the, the social and the environmental together in his landscape architecture, which was itself a, a form of activism and a form of, it's his way of, of um, bringing change to, to society and to the environment. And, you know, through, through his practice, through his professional practice. And I think it's, it's in, the intentionality behind his practice is different to most uh, professional uh, landscape architects. Yeah. And I think that we can learn a lot from that. 